my name is Stephen Lane. I am an organizer here at the Liberation Center. I'm a member of the Party for Socialism Liberation and part of our steering committee. I want to welcome everyone for coming out tonight for A People's Guide to Abolition and Disability Justice, the book by Katie Pastrum. So we're really excited that you are here. We also assembled a, a panel of Avengers to work with Katie tonight. Uh, <laughs> some great rebels in the struggle. So tonight we're celebrating. This is our first event in the Black August series. Uh, so thank you all for coming out. Um, as you all get in, in, into your conversation, if you wouldn't mind talking about what Black August means to you. Um, a little bit about our center. We started in this space in October 5th, 2023. So we're coming up on a year in this space. We were formerly at a small closet, no bigger than the size of any of these smaller offices on the Near East Side in the old AMP building. Uh, and just in a short amount of time uh, from 2020 when we got that office to now, you know, we really, I think, show what it means to collaborate with other people, with other workers over trying to always compete with each other. Like this is what, what happens. We, we just grow very quickly uh, when we're actually working together for what we want. Um, and for what we want tonight is to talk about um, incarceration and abolition and we support and we we appreciate any support that you give to the center as well uh, so if you're moved by tonight's presentation by tonight's panel um, please consider becoming a donor or sustainer of the center we're completely 100 percent funded by our community uh, so we do not take grants because we want to maintain our political independence um, without any strings attached we always um, pay as members we pay into this space and then we get a lot of support from a lot of from our workers like yourself So thank you all for coming out. I'm going to introduce our uh, MC tonight who is the wonderful Dr. Elizabeth Nelson uh, Dr. Nelson is a professor at IU Indianapolis in the medical humanities department Met her when I was in graduate school and you know fell in love with her immediately uh, her work uh, with Central State Hospital is really uh, amazing and quite incredible, and I um, think you all should look into into that that project. And then she also worked with uh, the women at the Indiana Women's Prison to write a book, Who Would Believe a Prisoner, and taught the prisoners how to do historical research and historical interpretation. And that book is excellent. Did you bring copies of that? And she will get copies of that book for us. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Dr. Uh, Elizabeth Nelson. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, so I'm going to try to just stay out of the way tonight. I'm going to introduce our illustrious panel um, and then kind of help facilitate some conversation. Uh, but we want to open it up to everyone. Um, so to start, I do want to say um, our uh, conversation is kind of prompted by this book, um, A People's Guide to Abolition and Disability uh, Justice by Katie Tastrum, which I've just devoured over the past couple of days. And this book is amazing and I think essential. I think this is going to be like uh, essential reading for uh, people in these various movements and it shows um, numerous points of entry for organizing like it's very practical and hopeful um, and accessible to read and it's got a lot of personality as well so <laughs> congratulations on the book Thank it's you. awesome um, so I'm going to introduce our panelists and I'm, I'll turn it over to you Katie to talk about the book and then we'll do a panel discussion then we'll open it up to everybody okay so um, to introduce Katie Tastrum um, she is a disability justice act activist and writer who has worked as a lawyer, a social worker, and a sex worker. Uh, her work has appeared in the anthologies Burn It Down, Feminist Manifestos for the Revolution, and Nourishing Resistance, Stories of Food, Protest, and Mutual Aid, as well as all over the internet, including Truth Out, Rewire, and Rooted in Rights. And she resides in Syracuse, New York. Um, right next to me, to my left, is Riley Sunyun Park. Um, who is a doctoral student in clinical psychology at the University of Indianapolis. 
Riley has been organizing with the Party for Socialism and uh, Liberation since 19, or 2019 and volunteering with the Indianapolis Liberation Center here since uh, 2021 and as part of their activity in the international Korean movement for the reunification and national liberation of their homeland. They co-edited Socialist Education in Korea, select, selected writings of Kim Il-sung, and have uh, published other writings on Korea for the Hampton Institute. And then down on the end is Sarah Full, uh, who is a disabled, chronically ill artist and teacher. She makes work uh, about the value, power, and complexity of a rural, a rural New York hill, the disabled body, and classroom teaching. Um, Sarah serves as an associate professor of photography and art and, and is the art education coordinator in the Department of Art and Design at the University of Indianapolis. And finally, Jock Horda, um, who is an organi organizer with Focus Initiatives, an abolitionist prison reentry program. After approximately 14 years of incarceration, off and on in facilities across the country, Jock emerged from this dark period of his life with a new sense of purpose and direction. He completely immersed himself in the movement and supports focus with housing, resources, information, and encouragement. Jock is also a leading member of the Pendleton II Defense Committee and is the co-director, co-producer, and co-writer of the award-winning documentary, The Pendleton II, They Stood Up. So with that, I'll turn it over to Katie. Thank you. All right. I'm going to stand up. Of course, I got to like get right in the. Hello. Um, all right. Ooh, not in the light. Okay. So, Hugo, I'll let you know when to turn. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, hi. I'm Katie Tastrom. Um, so, I'd like to start with framing, I think, um, for a number of reasons, but I think it's really important. And the first thing I'd like to start with is a purpose. I think, in general, in organizing or anytime we do anything, it's like, why are we here, right? What are we doing here? What is the what is our goals? But I use that kind of loosely, like, but um, because the things I'm going to talk about. So we're here. The purpose here, and my understanding, and there are more purposes too, but is to um, it's like educational to talk about these concepts and to learn from each other. So in a learning space, that the um, the expectation since we're all kind of learning new with this in terms of language and all that kind of stuff, you know, everyone. We understand that that we're here to learn and grow, and and so there's a little more flexibility. Feel free to kind of ask questions, and, and you know, we'll all be feel free to respond to them. But you know, it's a learning space, so I'm com you know, my own, you know, this is different than if I'm at you know policy stuff or whatever. And I just think it's important to kind of understand that I'm also one of the big things is that I'm not here to convince you of the of abolition or disability on uh, the importance of this. I'm kind of it's fine if you know any kind of knowledge or you have or don't beforehand, but this isn't, the purpose isn't for me to convince you. I'm not gonna be like, here's why you should, whatever. Um, I'm gonna, whether or not it's true, I'm gonna move from the assumption that we all kind of like get in general, you know, why abolition is important, why, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it, but why disability justice is also relevant. Um, So another part I want to talk about is this idea. So disability, um, as I'll talk about, disability has different meanings and different contexts that we move between all the time. Um, but I, when I say disability and disabled people, it's inherently neutral. It doesn't mean anything. There's, you know, it just is inherently. There's lots of things around it. Obviously, you know, that will change, and the context will change things. Obviously, you know, if you're someone who is born with a degenerative condition and uses a wheelchair because of that is in a different situation than someone who was shot by a police, a cop, and um, you know, uses a wheelchair because of what, that. You know what I mean? So um, when I say disability, and so along those lines too, when we talk about disability, if we're gonna just limit it to people in the past who are like, oh, hi, I'm disabled, um, that would be very limiting. So I'm gonna be talking, you know, might talk about people who we're gonna use the word disabled, maybe they do or don't identify that way, you know, coming at this from a place of us trying to understand these things and these systems. So um, I take a little bit of liberties, but I think they're they're reasonable and you know, if I'm incorrect then um, then I'm incorrect and hopefully the broader principle goes through. 
Um, the, another thing about this is I'm going to be talking about abolitionists sometimes talk about you know getting rid of the cop in their hearts. Um, I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about the cop in the street right now. That's what this is about. This isn't about like being nice to your friends. This isn't about um, whatever you know posting on Facebook or whatever. This is about the cop in the street, right? This is about the people that are locked up in jails, um, which you know, and, and there could be overlap, but I think all the time. So, and along those lines, so one of the big differences is that I think is important in general, and that leftists, I don't, I, I think we need to be very intentional and discerning about, but I don't think it's it's that difficult the concept is this idea of state power, right? So. We're talking here, active, the, this stuff we're talking about is about state power. Um, and state power isn't obviously just formally, you know, obviously cops have state power. You know, state power, your, your boss has state power. You know, depending on who your boss is, they have different degrees of it. Um, you know, your, for benefits you need, that's state power there. So state power is a lot of ways. But in general, your friends don't have state power, right? Like, state power, like someone hurting your feelings, a random person hurting your feelings or saying something mean to you, that's not state power. That doesn't mean that it's okay, that doesn't, whatever. But, um, so what I'm talking here is about state power. Um, and because that's what, you know, when we, ooh, when we talk about things being carceral, that means that carceral, incarceration, you're gonna end up in jail, right? Like, so we're talking about things, so yeah, you can kind of calling the cops on your friend, that's, you know, that is, can be, you know, kind of more, but, but y'all understand, I think, the distinction I'm trying to make. Um, all right, and the last thing in this part is, um, I'm, in the book I talk about it, but both, and so here I'm talking about um, disability a lot, but um, a disability, this disability lens is supposed to be in addition to the lens of you know white supremacy and like the anti-blackness and anti-indigenous and all the other things that go along with it. Um, also, um, you know, all the other kind of like feminist frames, all these things, these all go together. They're supposed to be, so the disability lens is an addition and doesn't take anything else away. Um, and as I talk about more in the book, and um, you probably can guess or might already know, the um, relationship between you know disability and blackness have a special relationship, right? Um, disability and indigenousness like have a special relationship in terms of the history, especially when it comes to prisons and policing, and how we got here. So, um, by which I mean the state has used disability, especially against these populations, and like really that's they're especially affected by all this. Um, okay, that's it. So, when we talk about disability, um, disability doesn't have just one meaning. We, all the time, and we're talking about it, we use it in different ways without realizing it. You know, I think about, I'm kind of borrowing from like queer theory or stuff, these like different ideas around like, it doesn't have to be what it's, 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 I think that is, it's not necessarily bad or good that it's like that, right? I think it can be helpful. Um, but I think it's important to note that. I'm not gonna like stop and say, like dis as I talk, disability will mean different things in, in different senses slightly. Um, I think it is important to understand that, especially when we look at the, um, when we talk about statistics and all these other kinds of things, because, you know, how are we defining disability? Um, you know, you'll see studies that say, oh, this people incarcerated with mental illness, what does that mean? Does that include developmental disabilities? Who is measuring? What do you do, blah, blah, blah. All these different things, there's not, so, we use disability to mean different things all the time. Um, disability also travels with other marginalizations. Um, so for the reasons I talked about, we don't really know, like, if there's, it's impossible to know, like, how many, you know, percentage, population, blah, blah. But pretty much, if someone, like everyone is, at pretty much the, the criminal justice system, if you're not disabled, when you get involved with it, you will be disabled pretty much soon after, especially if you're incarcerated, incarceration. Um, I'll talk about disablement, which is how the state uses disability as a weapon, but it's pretty safe to say, you know, when you think about like disability in the broadest sense, when you think about um, the different ways that, you know, from environmental racism, poor nutrition and maternal health, all these different things. Um, and we're talking about too, the, you know, the people who are incarcerated are multiply marginalized people, right? It's all, it's so, all these things go together, different kind of marginalizations that go together. Um, and those are the same populations who are incarcerated. So basically you have to have like, 
Um, their, their disability is always always a factor, and even if the person may like for like some isn't disabled in any way, they're at least then being perceived that way by the state. Right, we love that. So then a couple quick, I have so many concepts, I like didn't, okay, sorry. <laughs> but a couple quick about abolition that, um, just to frame the um, thing I'm gonna talk about, is so one of the things uh, that I talk about is abolition as a map. So um, when we talk about reform, reform doesn't have a definition, reform just means change, right? Like reform is a change. So. That could be any direction. You know, what I would say prison reform, okay, what is that, does that, you know, it could be like things that we would consider worse, you know, and a lot of times it is. Um, but so abolition, this idea of, you know, all these different carceral structures being gone, no one thinks it's gonna happen tomorrow, right? Like no one, um, but the right, they have this, you know, not with all this stuff with that Project 2025, even more, but even, you know, New Green Church Project with the mayor, but all these things, the right has a vision that they want. They know where they're going. They know what they want to look like. So I think of abolition kind of is a destination, right? We're going to get there, like, or we're, we're, that's where we're going towards, you know, most like, like any kind of liberation, you know, we're not, whatever, it's it's a, never going to be, we're never going to be there, but um, we need a direction to go in, and I feel like that's what abolition is. So, um, there's a concept in abolition about abolitionist reforms versus reformist reforms. So the analogy I use in the book with the map is that. I'm sorry. Oh, you're fine. I, I turn this thing off. No, I know. Mine. I'm always. I turn it off when I mean it for it to be on. My alarm. I. It doesn't go off when it's supposed to. And then goes off. Whatever. Um. But so. Basically, if we're if we think about like the current state right now, I say New York just because that's. Um, a state that you know and then we think of abolition is California like we want to make sure so the changes that we're making we want to make sure that we're going in the direction towards California right uh, and a lot of times things might be sold as like oh this is gonna be better we're gonna be you know it, um, policy could be sold as like oh this will be you know this will be better for incarcerated people but it actually in real life makes it so that the um makes things worse right maybe it'll give a lot of money to the police or maybe it'll be x y and z or you know there's other different different aspects of it um so something is abolitionist or not abolitionist or not it, it's not about the size of the change it's about the direction you're going in right so um, abolitionist reforms, you know, broadly are ways that will, things that are actually going to moving, actually moving us towards where we want to go. And reformist reforms are ones that aren't, um, and they're usually sold like they are, though. Um, you can go to the next one. So this is a concept, I don't talk about this in my book, but I do, because, but, like, this is kind of what the whole book is, but also, so, but I would talk about the carceral tree. So this is kind of like a conception um, that I kind of use as like a shorthand to explain how we how we make these changes. So first, it's by kind of like mapping out where we are, showing where we are. So here we have you know like jails and prisons, all these different kind of things, nursing homes, etc., um, institutions, you know, all these places where people are locked up against their will. And down here we have all these things that we know created them. We have and. These are just some examples, but um, you know, white supremacy, you know, especially and including, but um, chattel slavery, um, all sorts of things around that. Um, colonization, you know, including like the direct colonization, the U.S. colonization of like the 1600s to 1800s, but also like boarding schools and all that kind of stuff. You know, these these. Big concepts, lots of these, right? So, but these are kind of like the concepts, and these are the kind of what it ends up with. So, right? So, like, what's here? All right, go next. One. So, this is what we need to focus on cutting down, right? Um, and this is policy. Policy, I don't, I mean laws, but I don't just mean laws. I mean anything that applies to like more than one person, right? Policies can be whether you're, you know, like in COVID, whether your boss let people work from home or how much, how hard they were, you know, it could be, or it can be like broader policies, like national laws, policies, whatever. But anything, policy is kind of, 
anything, all the rules and, and things like that. So, examples of policy, I had fun with the little PowerPoint, or that was a good little picture, okay. Um, so, and what I talk a lot about, in the book about, is the kind of policies that contribute, um, that create the carceral state. So, for example, and there's so many of them, it's all kind of interacting and weaving, um, but we talk about like, so welfare, right? And like, um, the lack of, so we talk about, especially like, for example, the 1996 like welfare like reforms, um, but just the idea, the fact of like lack of social safety net, we know that contributes directly to incarceration. Um, and so any kind, so, so, and we know too, anything where you're giving money to people, money to marginalized people will reduce incarceration. Um, drug policy, um, you know, a lot of this stuff is like so, and kind of what I talk about, it's like, oh yeah, of course, like, you know, a lot of this stuff is pretty intuitive, and that's, but um, privatized healthcare, that's a huge one. So this idea, the fact that our healthcare, even if you are able to get Medicaid or Medicare, which is a public healthcare, is still in these privatized systems, where the purpose, talking about purpose, the purpose of these systems is profit. You know, and, and even the ones that aren't, that are non-profit, they're in a marketplace um, with, for, with, you know, the other ones, and so in all, and so in all the, so you see this on policy levels, different stuff for like, for example, the Affordable Care Act, which, whether well, it was overall good, but, you know, it, it's complicated, right? But like, we only, you know, we only have the power we have into making those changes, so, um, Sorry, that's just me deciding not to go down that little path, but we'll go back here. Okay. Um, but yeah, so when we see healthcare too, especially in healthcare, especially with disabled people, you know, there's such a huge link um, between all of, I mean, I can go on forever, but, um, but, but healthcare in general, and this way that, oh yeah, like the Affordable Care Act, how we, you know, there could have been this way to like push towards, you know, um, public models, um, but, you know, there was further entrenchment in the, the insurance system and all these things. And, and so organizing, and this is the thing too, is a lot of times leftists don't, the like a little benefit policy is not as sexy as like an industry and throwing bricks and whatever, whatever. But like benefit, this is the shit that keeps people alive and it's organized, you know what I mean? Like this is, it's, these things make differences in people's lives. And so, um, yeah, we'll keep going, but you can turn that thing. How long have I been talking for about? Good question. <laughs> Ten minutes? Yeah. Okay, perfect. That's, that's great. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Okay. That's good. I'm getting to so, the end of this report. So, so, specifically, there's a lot of the policies that create the carceral state specifically target disabled people and make it so disabled people are... Everyone is disabled and disabled people are way more likely to be, especially multiple marginalized disabled people, um, have some kind of interaction in the criminal justice system. So, disability benefits. I did, when I worked as an attorney, I did SSI and SSDI federal court appeals. You do not want to get me started about talking about this because I will go on forever about it. But um, this, as the SSI and SSDI is so important when it comes to all these concepts. Um, I'll just hit a couple things real quick is that they require living in poverty. You, um, the amount of money that you're allowed to make or have is so, so, so low um, that literally, if you're born disabled in the US, and so therefore you can't qualify it, it, to the point where you disabled, right now the codes mean the US government definition under these laws, which is very different from the way we usually use it. Um, you to stay eligible, you have to live the rest of your life in poverty. There's no way around that. Um, they will not, it doesn't matter. Um, so just think about that, right? Like if you're like no fault of your own, you're just, that's like, and so the, also SSI and SSDI is a very overt way of um, grouping the like deserving disabled, deserving poor and undeserving poor. Um, SSDI has a little, you get a little bit more, it's a little bit better, it's all bad, but one's better than the other, um, but you have to have worked for a certain period of time to be eligible for it. So, and that's like the biggest, that's the main difference, um, is that if you're able to work a certain amount of time, then before you become disabled, then 
it's still shitty, but it's still, but you get a little bit more money. You know what I mean? And just that way, like, just think about it. It's so fucked up. Like, um, so, and there's a million more things in this in the law that are messed up, but you see how, you know, especially, and this is in poverty and homelessness and incarceration and health and disability, all these, and drugs, all this stuff are so intertwined that <coughs> what, we can break it apart and start, like, working on these little threads and making it better and, you know, this is how we, we get these things down. Um, because, in, once again, these are, you know, concrete things. Um, other ways, you know, involuntary holds and, in admissions, basically, if you're disabled, um, you can, you know, they can, I mean, they kind of can't, even if you're not disabled, they can just say you're disabled, but, um, you know, um, Child Protective Services, um, Dorothy Roberts' book, Torn Apart, is amazing. Everyone needs to read it. And she, but she um, makes a wonderful case for the abolishing um, the child welfare system. But one of the things specifically with disability and in a lot of states, I think most states, um, Disability alone is reason enough for legally for them to take your kids from you. Um, and in other places, like there's so many stories of um, ableism in every part of this process. Um, disabled kids are more likely to be removed. They're more likely to end up in foster care. They're more likely to end up in foster care for longer periods of time. They're more likely, you know, all these things. Um, and so, and all these things lead to, too, you know, the school to prison pipeline. Um, especially, too, we talk about, you know, their segregated education. Um, and then another thing is, so that you can see too, another that is the disability rights legislation that there is the ADA, which is I, amazing for, the ADA does a lot of stuff that can, and I use it a lot, it can be really helpful, but the ADA is focused, even though there's different, a few different areas too, but the main focus is on the rights of an employee, right? So you have to be hired, you have to be like in a place where you're working, you know, um, and that's where, and that's where like the gains and rights are. Are the 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 framework of the ADA is like, oh, well, getting disabled people into this capitalist thing, which you know, nothing, no, nowhere where we are is in a vacuum, right? It's from where we came before, so that's part of it. Is there more? Oh, and this is the last slide. Okay, and so then the last comment, the last uh, concept I just want to talk about really quick, and I kind of mentioned at the beginning, is disablement. So. If the government, if you know things like um, involuntary holds, you know incarceration. If you can be incarcerated because you're disabled, um, the, if a cop wants, all they need to do is say you're disabled to incarcerate you. Um, in, incarceration in different environments, but a lot of times they end up being kind of the same, either literally or figuratively. Um, but we talk about like, um, I think it, Harriet Washington, Dr. Harriet Washington has a book, um, A Terrible Thing to Waste, which is really good about environmental racism. But you talk about how. Um, you know, there's all these neighborhoods, you know, um, Syracuse is a huge lead problem. Um, so we have all these things that are happening that are making, that are disabling people and, and harming them. Um, but and that, and so when, so the state can just, the state can literally disable people to get them under control um, and use, you know, disablement also as a weapon, um, as part of, we know, you know, we know that incarceration, part of the punishment of incarceration is the shitty food, the shitty conditions, the, is the physical toll, the, the health, the no health care, the, all these different things. Um, that's an intentional part of it. So, um, and obviously if you already are disabled, you're more vulnerable to um, disability and death as well. So it just really, all these things kind of compound on top of each other. And so, yeah, and so that's all for now. So, you know, if anybody is speaking and you want to respond to them, like, you don't have to wait for your turn. Like, it's okay if this is casual and conversational, but I want to give each of you the floor for a few minutes, and then we'll kind of just open it up to, to conversation. So I'll just pass it to you because you're next to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. cool. um, yeah, I will try not to take too long, but I think I'll go <laughs> Uh, well, first and foremost, thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, so, you know, I, I think as I was sort of reading through the book uh, this uh, over the last couple of days, I kept thinking about a couple things. So, one, I think like there's another di there's another dimension uh, within uh, disability justice that uh, anti-imperialism, right? Uh, 
we think um, the way that the U.S. military had, the mechanisms of the U.S. military and also U.S. imperialism has an effect on the communities in which it occupies, right? Um, and so I was thinking about that. I was also thinking about um, today, which co coincidentally is the, um, the anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And um, last year I was on a, um, I was on a delegation trip to Korea, and one of the site, uh, one of the visits that we visited, was visiting um, first and second generation A bomb survivors. And um, essentially, um, Korean um, Korean survivors were brought to Japan, um, mostly through forced labor, conscription, or as economic refugees, and then. The bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki brought on debilitation um, through radiation poisoning, through all of these different mechanisms of um, yeah, debilitating um, condition. And so um, Japanese survivors had fought a, a very long struggle to get uh, recognition and compensation and aid from, uh, from Japan and also from the United States. Korean survivors have not been able to um, get a formal apology from both Japan and the United States. Um, and then there are second gen survivors who um, have not um, received any sort of compensation, aid, or recognition from both South Korea, Japan, and the US. And so I kept thinking about the way that the state has a monopoly on who is considered to be disabled and who is considered not to be disabled, even though that the state has a very long history of co um, committing violence through military occupation, through uh, you know arms, um, producing arms, and also through uh, military occupation. And, um, and also through police and through um, all these different mechanisms. And so I was just kind of thinking about the, through these things and like the way that debilitation and disability and disablement all kind of work in tandem with each other. Um, and so kind of moving beyond simply just saying, oh, you are disabled, you're not, but like moving through solidarity, uh, building solidarity networks on the basis that we all are dealing with some level of debilitation at some point um, in our lives and kind of um, thinking through some of how we can build with other people, um, especially in a time when there is such um, of an organized uh, abandonment by the state because of COVID or we, um, through um, through the, the funneling of money and supplies and genocide, you know, for genocide in Palestine and with this um, U.S. support of the Zionist occupation, etc. So that's kind of what all I wanted to say. That, yeah, hope that made sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> call me Ja, and uh, I'm an abolitionist. Very proud to say that. Uh, it took me a while to get here, believe it or not. Uh, I was in prison uh, almost for 15 years altogether, off and on. And uh, when I got out, uh, Ideal Sea Watch, Nick Grevin, was referred to me by a friend of mine who was incarcerated. and. Uh, and Nick Revin came to my house and spoke to me. And we developed a bond, trust. So then I started to listen to the things that were being said, the books that we were reading, you know. Once that trust was developed, I opened myself up to uh, the information that they were getting involved in. And since he was doing so much for me as a friend, I wanted to reciprocate, and he kept saying that's the only thing he was asking if uh, 
I would attend with him, and I did. And I remember one of the first meetings that we had, and they said they were abolitionists. And I said, okay, what exactly does that mean? Well, we want to see a, a prison abolished. And after me doing 15 years in prison, what I said was, I don't know if that's a good idea. <laughs> you know, now I'm upset by that. Because as I studied more, and as I learned more, I realized now how I was programmed, you know, to come to that conclusion, you know. And it was like a slave advocating for slavery. You know what I mean? Uh, and that was a very eye-opening experience for me. It made me look at everything differently. And it gave me that righteous anger <laughs> you know when you know you've been lied to and you know you've been manipulated and you know you've been like the uh, the rat race uh, uh, the the the, uh, the dividers forcing you to run in certain pathways and that's what had happened to me in my life and now I am completely an advocate for abolition Prison should be destroyed, top to bottom. It literally serves no one but the mega wealthy, the super <laughs> elite, uber rich, That's who, and the, gov the powers that be that want to maintain control over each and every one of us. I really appreciate the, uh, what you were saying, Katie, about disability even being used as a state form of control. When that breaks down, we begin to see that every avenue, every, uh, anything that they can use to separate us from one another. We're the same people going through the same struggles, trying to figure this thing called life out, the best of our abilities, you know. But they want to divide and separate us because they know that guarantees their power is maintained for another day. Okay, so once I begin to learn these types of concepts, I begin to rally against and rage against the concepts of separatism, uh, the, the big me's and little you's, you know. It's not the way that we were designed to be. We were designed to have compassion for one another. We were designed to assist one another that's how it used to be, <laughs> you know, years ago. People used, communities used to bear together. And, 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 and that old saying, it takes a, a village to raise a child. That was a real thing. But once the powers that be said, hey, if we continue with this, then one day these same group of people who are so unified might one day realize how we're robbing them blind. <laughs> and they might turn against us. We have to create divisions today. How can we do that? Okay, let's start with this. He's dark brown, she's light brown. Okay, that's division right there. Okay, he wants to worship here, he wants to worship there. That's division the right there. She wants to love this person, he wants to love this person. We can divide there as well, you know. We can turn them all against each other to where they're all looking at us. And even if there's one group that suddenly realize how we duped them, we can easily snuff them out, you know? So this, from where I stand, is the way that we bring abolition to the forefront, is by uniting as a community, coming together as a people, one people, I want the best for each and every person in here. Why would I not? <laughs> I want you to have the best life experience that can possibly be attained. I would never want to stand in the way of that. Because if I can see you achieve it, that means there's hope for me. You know? The only reason I would want to, or anybody would want to stomp that out, is because they want to deny you so they can have more. That's the only reason. So 
I'm very glad that we're here to celebrate this, to talk about this great book that I haven't read yet, but it is on our book list. <laughs> And, uh, and, uh, and as I said, I heard great reviews about it, so I can't wait to dig in. But, uh, but it's very necessary for us to continue to meet. And it's very important for us to realize that we are seeds. Each and every one of us is a seed. Because there are a group of people that you can reach that would never consider listening, you know? And that you can talk to that you might have the right terminology to prick their hearts in a way where I might not be able to. So it's very important that we have to stand together, you know, especially with my buddy Wednesday back there. <laughs> very important that we stand together and push this message forward. Because if we do not, point blank period, people will die. That's what we're up against. We can say this, that, and the other, but if we do nothing, more people will die. And it will be because of our lack of initiation. And that's something I just can't bear on my conscience. So I'm gonna pass the mic and, uh, and thank you guys once again. There are three things that I just wanted to bring into the conversation. Thank you for all of those beautiful reflections and that uh, content that you shared, Katie. So uh, I've been a teacher for 22 years in a variety of different contexts. And in terms of things that are used to divide and separate, one thing that I just wanted to point out within the context of this conversation, you mentioned it, Katie, segregated education is the function of special education versus general education in the world around us. Um, special education is a really normalized structure. A lot of people think of it as a natural and necessary and humane solution to the fact that there are ability non-normative people in the world or people that don't fit into certain social rules easily. Um, and so what schools are doing is modeling for young people the idea that separation is natural and important and inevitable from incredibly young ages. So dismantling special education and general education and modeling for students in schools what inclusion can look like, what community can look like, what the idea of people living together and being with one another um, that's a powerful space, I think, for this work to evolve and be enacted. And it's, it's just such an insidious structure that doesn't get called out frequently enough. And we know that in schools, certain groups of young people, young people from certain identities and backgrounds, are going to get tracked into special education and get certain labels disability labels placed upon them with much greater frequency. So for example, so-called emotional impairment is a label that gets placed upon young black children, specifically boys, by their predominantly white teachers disproportionately, right? And so is it like a brute fact that young black boys are more emotionally disturbed than their peers? No, absolutely not. This is racism and ableism, obviously. Um, and when you get an emotional impairment label, just like Katie was saying, then it, it's rationalized. It sets into motion this whole machine. Well, you need to be separated from your peers. You're a threat to your peers. And students see this, young people see this in the world around them. So these forces are just horrifying and at play and it's just, I wanted to bring that into the conversation, the, the power of these labels and how quickly they can deteriorate someone's life. Um, and that's just one example of disproportionate tracking of uh, folks into particular disability labels to rationalize. Um, treating them horribly. 
one thing that I'm, the second thing, uh, I'm curious about the relationship between institutionalization and incarceration. I don't know enough about that interrelationship to say anything about it, but mm -hmm. I'm curious about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to talk, third thing, really briefly about what brings me into this work. So as an artist, I'm really interested in thinking about the representation of disability in the world around us. I would say that in dominant culture, disability is represented when it is represented in deficit-centric terms, um, almost always in one-dimensional terms. So um, part of what I hope I see more of in the world are more diverse representations of disability. Uh, when Stephen was introducing us, he mentioned that we were like the Avengers, um, which always makes me think, I don't know the Marvel Universe, but X-Men, that's basically like the apotheosis of people with disabilities, right? Like, we're superheroes, the disabled are. Um, and I think about that in the world around us, and then I think about how horrific some representations of disability can be and how demoralizing and demeaning and I'm curious about that. Uh, a common question that people get when they find out that you're chronically ill or disabled or a, a common question that I get is what's wrong with you? Um, and when I was 27 I came into contact with someone connected to disability justice for the first time, and they were like, well, that's not the right question. There's nothing wrong with you. And I had always suspected that that was actually the case, but to hear it validated by someone else, it was a really powerful moment. And I think that there are so many people in the world who would also benefit from the lenses that were offered by Jack and Katie and Riley. Um, so, those are a couple of things that I wanted to say. Cool. Thank you. I don't, can I say something? So, I think that actually this is something that um, I've been thinking about, and it, it ties into a lot of like what we're talking about. Is this uh, two things that kind of seem separate, but they're not? But um, this idea of like labels and identity and um, disability and the how malleable it is and how because it doesn't mean anything or mean so many things, it's like, it always depends on like, what are we what are we doing this for and why, right? So it's like, you know, getting the diagnosis when you, that you're talking about with, you know, certain populations, what are we saying, right, when we do that? And like, and, but also on the, not even really flip side, but also, you know, when I, when I say like, oh, I'm disabled or I'm part of this community or whatever, what am I saying with that, right? And, and, and like any word, we're, any communication, we're communicating lots of things when we use it. And so I just think that, that this is just kind of a, in general, I think that it is really important to like dial back and think, okay, what are we saying when we say this, right? Is this, where is this coming from? What are we, what kind of messages are we putting out? And so this idea, and one of the things that I think is interesting about disability and the kind of duality of, of disability itself is this idea of like, there's something wrong with you or, or there's something, you know, non-normative. And this idea, I've been thinking lately and, Forgive me if this gets a little abstract, but uh, but this idea of like disability as a way, like so so the way humans we everything the only way we can mediate anything is through the body, right? Like all of our bodies, we can't. That's the only way we get information. That's the only way. So everything is mediated through a body. There's always a body. So if there's always a body, there always needs to be a standpoint, right? And even though we think of in our heads as like a normative body, there's like a normative body, when you dial down into a standpoint, it has to be a body. And that body's gonna have characteristics, right? You know what I mean? Like the, it's all, there's no objective place from which to have a vantage point. There's no objective body, there's no kind of thing, you know, bodies are material. And I think of disability as this reminder in an intersectional way of 
non-normativity, non-normative body. There's no body, there's no right way for a body to work. There's no right way to learn, right? Because it, it is so interesting, you know, it, this is partially obviously related to because of my white privilege, but thinking about, you know, it, I didn't get, um, I didn't realize I was like neurodiverse until like way later, which is wild. If, you know, you'll see me. It's like wild that no one caught that. I dropped out of high school and stuff. Like I, but um, no one really cared, which is you know. But that's a whole different story. But anyway, um, but I like my brain. Like I mean, there's parts of it that I'm like whatever in terms of like comfort or you know that I don't that I'm like oh, I wish it wasn't that. But like you know my fast processing and all this kind of stuff. This very that's so much me. Like these parts of me that, I, that are related to these other things. Um, it's so much me, so I've been lucky in that for me it's been, in part a lot of this is privilege in, in, in many ways, that it's easy to see disability for me it, as this non, not positive, not negative, not just this other, this, these things, right? And it just, because, like, does the normative body have two legs? No, like there's no, there can't, there, you know, we can use different, uh, I'm not trying to get into like the linguistics part, but you know what I'm trying to say, because there's, everything is experienced through a body. So when we talk about all this stuff, we're talking about bodies, we're talking about bodies in prisons, we're talking about bodies in schools, and a, a body in one classroom and a different body in a different classroom, because of what, you know, we're talking about bodies, and so I think that bodies, generally and disability generally are really helpful concepts and I think when we talk about bodies specifically disability specifically those are also helpful but it's a different calculation you know and so and I do because I think that with disability because it like being labeled so getting so understanding more of my how my brain works and stuff was helpful for me like that so like diagnosis in that context was helpful for me right like the point being that all these things that exist, they don't exist in a vacuum and they are all influenced by the other things around them. All this kind of stuff was influenced by my whiteness. It was all influenced by my disabilities. It was all influenced by my, you know, being working class or whatever. It was all influenced by all these things. And so, and it's just a reminder, I mean, we all know this, but that like, there is no default, you know, and just kind of go back to that. And um, so, I don't know, this is something that this kind of brought up for me, but thinking about these things both in these like broad conceptual ways and in these concrete ways, and understanding that the, the end result might be different. And that's okay, because a lot of it is just kind of limits of language or how we, whatever. Can I, can Absolutely, I'm done. That, uh, that's my little... Oops, sorry. Yeah, I just, um, this is making me think of, well, it, it's taking me back to something that you said in your, your presentation earlier, Katie, which is that everybody incarcerated is disabled, like, you know, by the very, you know, by the experience of, of incarceration itself, right? And so I'm trying to put that next to this this other conversation. And like you said, disability is used in different ways depending on the context. And there's, you know, the conversation about because you're disabled, that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you or that you need to be fixed, right? On the other hand, there is this process of disabling and of harming people, right? And which disability is something that shouldn't have occurred, right? And it's a bad thing, right? Um, and, you know, and so I'm, one thing that I'm trying to think about in some of my own work is like, okay, well, how do we talk about that? How do we talk about these harms in ways that are not um, stigmatizing of disability, that, rec that recognize harm, that also don't necessarily locate the problem in the individual, but in the system, right? But also are real about, you know, the effects on that person's life, right? And which are which are not positive things. And um, yeah, I'm just wondering if any of you want to speak to that. Which is actually very related to what is for me personally. I, I understand what you're saying because all these things exist on so many different levels, and it's yeah. kind of what. And to me, so that's one that you get really concrete because I think it's it actually it's. It's complicated when we talk about it like up here, but when we talk about it down here, I think it's actually really simple. Like like I was talking about before in my examples, like if, if I think it's really easy for us to understand, like, oh, if you're born you know, if different bodies work differently and that's you know, if you're born or so you know, whatever, versus a uh, police shooting someone. Like I think in concrete in real life, like we it's really not that you know what I mean? And, and I think 
the ways that we move between talking about the personal and the general, yeah. and I think is kind of interrogates a lot of this, and just, and there's the, like, to whose satisfaction, you know what I mean? Like, who reading, the, like, like, I have my opinion, and like, I can tell you what I think, you know, but, and what are we communicating? So I think there is a lot of things, that, and especially when you're communicating, it's not just what you're saying, it's how it's being taken, and so, basically, I think all of it is, con everything is contextual, and I think, and I think that a lot of this stuff on, like, a, when we're talking about people's actual lives is relatively clear, you know what I mean? I, I think, but I think the language around it, yeah. I, I think it is just kind of a dance, right? But I, but I think in real, I think we understand it. I think it's less complicated than it seems. Does that make sense? I don't know if other people. Um, oh, yeah. You want to? Yeah. Yeah, um, I was, um, I was reading through this, this uh, book that I've been sort of reading, I, I mentioned to, to you earlier. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, it, it's called The Right to Name um, by Jasmine Poir. Uh, it's uh, a, a, a really eye-opening book. It's, it's a bit long, but um, uh, yeah. Um, but in the book she talks about like the way that like debility, disability, and all these things kind of work in tandem with each other. Um, as I mentioned earlier, and then there was one point in the book she talks about, like in the context of Palestine, and how um, it, uh, there are um, there there are there are mechanism like what, what she says is that in the book like um, there there's a particular viewpoint that there are disabling um, mechanisms to uh, the colonization or the colonial occupation. But she argues that it's not necessarily the, like it's not the, like there are things that are disabling, it's the entire entirety of the occupation, the colonial occupation that is debilitating, right? Through um, the airstrikes, you know, through the construction of movement, um, through the cat, like you know, the way that the um, occupation limits calorie intake, the way it limits water intake or water consumption, water intake, uh, the blockade of, of Hazza, uh, and also the way that the uh, people are um, experience violence through the IOF or through the, the, the um, through imprisonment. Uh, and stuff like that. So, and, and it also goes, you know, in in ways of like imperialism and in like war and in the way that you know Lockheed Martin or Raytheon or all these different manufacturing companies literally make technologies for um, bombs and weapons and surveillance and all these different things. There's a particular form of um, like a body like a body politic or like a, a biopolitic. Uh, that goes to like um, the way that again capitalism, the state has a monopoly on who they designate as deserving and who they target for particular forms of debilitating, disablement, maiming, etc. So through state violence, through police, through you know all these different mechanisms. So and you know disability. Um, looks different in different contexts. Um, it may not look the same here as it does in other places and stuff. Um, yeah. So I think that's I think that's where like I think that's where like disability justice comes in into play into that because it's like. But then again, it's like another thing where it's like again, it may not look the same on different areas and stuff like that. The way that we conceptualize disability justice here in the United States. Um, looks different and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's kind of, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I was going to turn over, but go ahead. Yeah. Does, it, does anyone have any questions, comments, statements? I would, if, I have a question for that. I would, I'm just curious too um, about your experiences. I was, um, I guess everyone, in terms of their experiences with disability in this work, in your life, in your, in terms of like, just your your thoughts or insights into connections you've seen between disability and incarceration, disability, all that kind of stuff. 
Uh, well, I did, and what I wanted to say kind of relates into that. You know, everybody has more levels of ability in certain areas than other people. Yeah. Riley runs circles around me in here. <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is, you know, it's the truth. Um, but I, I, I was reflecting, and it all ties in, but I was reflecting on what you had said about uh, the difference between incarceration and institutionalization, which is a great question, you know, because there is a, a, a stark difference, you know, because uh, incarceration is the locking up of the body, prohibiting movement of the body. That comes with trauma, okay? That comes with trauma, you know? Sometimes I think about my cat, Miss Moneypenny, and, uh, <laughs> and when I'm eating, I make me some food, and then I'll make her her cat food, and I'll put it in the bathroom. She'll go in and get it. I'll close the door so I can go eat in peace, right? <laughs> I, I, I admit it, right? <laughs> she goes and eats after she's done. I'm like, here I come. <laughs> you know, even for a cat, I don't want what you got me locked in here for. <laughs> I don't want to be here like this. What are you doing? You know what I'm saying? So uh, when it comes to carceral, that's the trauma that comes from being incarcerated. But then when it comes to institutionalization, that's when you allow the bars and the walls to become a part of your mind. That's when you say to yourself, this is my plight. This is my identity. You know, this is who I am. You know, so that is the big transition. And unfortunately, if you're not talked to or taught about this type of uh, dynamic, it can be a natural progression. You know, if you hear for 10 days, then 100 days, then a thousand days, you can easily come to the point where you say, hey, this is me. Now I can, I can allow it to absorb my soul, you know? And um, even with, uh, there was this one, um, uh, a psychologist, I believe it was, who did an experiment on a German shepherd, put him in a cage, and every day he would allow uh, small electric shocks you know, to be all over the floor. And then uh, uh, initially the German Shepherd, every day he would fight and rally, you know, jump from this side to that side, that side to the other, looking for some safe space, looking for a way to get out. But over a period of time, as those electric shocks continued, the dog just laid in that same spot. Didn't even jump anymore. And at that point, it was only half of the cage that had electric shocks. If he just walked three feet over, he would be completely away. But it had become a part of his mind so much. This is inevitable, it's inescapable. This is my plight, this is my destiny. That's into institutionalization. That almost happened to me, you know? That it was so close to happening to me. You know, when I got out of prison in 2020, after 15 years incarcerated, hard incarceration, that's behind bars, every day, 15 years. And then another five maybe with probation and parole and house arrest and work release, five, six, maybe seven years of that. So it's just 15 years hard incarceration and maybe five, six, seven, the softer type, you know. So when I got out of prison this time, I said, I can't go back. I just can't go back. I don't know how to stay out. I don't know how to stay out. Every direction I take, every move I've made always seems to throw me back in. Okay, this is what I'm gonna do. This was my plan. I'm gonna go to work and I'm gonna come home. And beyond that, I'll have a family member or somebody who cares about me to go, if I gotta get something from the store, you go. Here's the money, you go. If I need some food, here, you go get it. I'll stay here. 
oh, it's time to go to work. I'm going from here straight to work, you know. I locked myself up, you know, which was the plan of the enemy. One of them, <laughs> you know, which was the plan of the enemy. And they said, oh, we got it. We got it, you know, good slave. <laughs> Self-check, good slave, you know. Until I met the members of IDOC Watch, and until I met the members of Focus, who came to me and said, no, 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 no. You have a right to life. A God-given right that no one has the right to take away from you. No one has the right to tell you that you're not deserving. And then they followed through with the information that was given. And then I began to see certain things and learn certain facts and receive certain information that opened up my mind to a whole new place. To where now, I'm like, you're damn right. <laughs> you're damn right. I'm supposed to see the world, you know? Just like a lot of my friends and, and, and loved ones who travel all over the place. I'm supposed to experience these different types of wonderful food, you know? I'm supposed to go to these beautiful places. I'm supposed to make a new friend every single day. That's the riches of life. That's the riches of life. So I'm glad to say I have been incarcerated, but I am not institutionalized. <laughs> and it was a process to get there. And it was such a... Um, personal journey for myself that I followed and kept my eyes open and experienced and let it live within me that I see it for what it is and now I can share it with other people you know now I can share it with other people and that's even more empowerment because now when you see that that uh, that glimmer in their eyes and they say wait a minute I can do this you're right, I can do this. Then I say, I knew it all along. <laughs> and that's the game changer, you know. So, and then, and, and in closing, uh, it's not only incarceration. Incarceration brings trauma. And incarceration is multiplied levels of trauma. But people out here experience trauma all the time, every day. Horrific stories I've heard. And they let that become a part of them until that self-defeat. I cannot come out of this. I'm too deep to ever begin to grow. I couldn't even conceive of it, you know? That's that institutionalization that people experience right out here. That self-defeat, you know? We see it all the time. We see it all the time. We have to be proactive in eliminating that into helping people reach that point to where they can see the empowerment within themselves. Because this is the good news. Once that empowerment is triggered, ooh, it's hard to sit them down. <laughs> it's hard to sit them down after that. And that's the beauty of it, you know? So that was a great question you had asked. Yeah, yeah and that just kind of made me think of like the institute, like thinking about institutions right is like this broad like this institutionalization and this lie this fundamental lie about that you're that they're helping you in some way right you're there for a reason like so we talk about jill you're there because why because it'll make people safer no we have you know because that's the thing is they can't because everything you want is the purpose that we know studies show that, that does, it actually makes all that work so um there's these places and so we think about this idea of like different places, you know, like nursing homes or maybe like institute or something where there's like, oh, disabled people need to be in these places for care, need to get something. Like, first of all, most of the places don't have care. Most of, most, you know, you talk about being in different places, but a lot of them, it's the, the, the there can be material differences, but it's the same, right? People go between, you know, you go between, you, you know, I know people, it depends on where you are and what the thing is, but it could be like, Oh, you're in jail. Maybe you can get some time off if you go to this other kind of institutionalized place. Maybe it's you know for maybe they say like mental health or whatever. Maybe you'll get time off. 
maybe the material conditions will be better, maybe they'll be worse, maybe, you know, it's all these, there's just a lot of different places where people are locked up and there can be different rationales. But if you look and think about like what, you know, um, and I, t I talk a lot about it in the book, but, so one of the things, so Leah, Leah Ben Moshi, who wrote Dis Decarcerating Disability, has this really, um, really interesting um, the concept that I that I've already but the myth of um, trans incarceration. Thank you. Yeah, trans incarceration. Yeah, yeah. The myth of trans incarceration. We have this idea that there were these institutions for um, people with mental health issues, and that they close, and then those people are homeless. But actually, and, and now are in jails and prisons. But actually, that's not what happened. Um, they, the people we can tell by the populations um, is that institutions, you know, the um, used to be full of in a different kind of institutions, like mental health specific institutions, um, were full of were mostly white women, and then and now we see that they're mostly black men um, and indigenous men once again, like um, like prisons and jails. So basically, like and even materially, like there can be differences, but it's the same. You know what I mean? Like it's by it's like place by place. Like some places might have better food, or some places might have better you know whatever, but. But they're they're very similar in that, and one thing that they have in common, they're they're not healing. So that's one of the things, like the distinction I make is between care and healing, and this idea of like, um, and for for anyone, the most healing thing is non-institutional. Like institutions aren't heal inherently are, aren't healing. They do the opposite, and so um, of all kinds. And so, and the things in. It's a myth, like this idea that we need these places for anything. Like, no, well, and just once again, I like to get really concrete about stuff. What do you need? Okay, how can we do that? Other things. That doesn't mean right this second we have all the resources, you know, whatever. But it means that um, these places, like all these places, aren't helping and they're not doing anything that's helpful. And studies, you know, show that. <coughs> okay. Did folks from the uh, audience want to? ask a question or comment at all? I actually have something. Yeah. Um, and you, can you pass the mic? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm Sean. I'm Katie's partner. Um, and uh, so in relation to your school stuff, um, I work for an organization in New York called BOCES. Um, and it is basically a support organization, um, like, you know, a publicly funded support organization for all of the school districts in several counties. Um, and one of the stark things I noticed was that, you know, that difference with, uh, you know, general education and, and special education. But what really got me fucked up is, so, my BOCES is OCM BOCES, which is Onondaga, Cortland, and Madison counties, um, which are all surrounding Syracuse, New York, where we live. And I am an IT person, and so I was looking at our network map. And our network map has a big map of all of the school districts with little lines going to our central hub. And the thing I noticed missing was Syracuse. Because, because of institutionalized racism and that separation of you know, educational standards, Syracuse is not considered part of our county. There is, the Syracuse city limits is shaped like a skull. And it is in the middle of this map, is just a void where all of these people are not getting any of the support that we provide. You know, we provide grading support, we provide printing support, we provide, you know, payroll support, uh, we provide my extremely good IT support because I'm great. Um, and there's just this void in the middle of these 50 school districts that we support. And the one that the area is named after gets nothing. And, you know, that, and that's why we have, like, you know, higher lead levels, and that's why we have, you know, all, all, all of this lack of stuff because you know, the people in the suburbs get whatever they need. <coughs> and there's just this void. And yeah, I just had to yeah. nerd ever to really, leave really to me. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 
I'm going to apologize before I say this. i got to leave as soon as I'm done because i got to go get groceries and go home. So I'm sorry <laughs> if, I'm running, if I run out right after this. But I wanted to say one thing, which was the thing I really liked in the presentation, um, something you said towards the beginning about how we need, how our target right now should be the cop in the street. Like that, that you know, people often like have this idea that, Anyway, I feel like having a material analysis of the society we live in is really useful because a lot of people think that the source of mass incarceration is that people have racist ideas and that, that just kind of come out of nowhere because people are just racist and that's why we have mass incarceration. Or that, oh, people just have these bad ideas about disabled people and that's why we, our society treats disabled people so bad. Um, but like, you know, I think that one of the common threads is that what is you know disability and how it's constructed and what is crime and like who's considered a criminal those kinds of things are socially constructed which doesn't mean that they're not real i feel like people insist when people say something socially constructed they they'll sometimes they'll just say it like that means it's not real actually the way our social relations play out like determines every factor of our lives so for example like a disabled person in a society where we have great public transit great health care great all of these things their quality of life is not going to be as drastically different as a disabled person is in a society that was not doing that had no institutions that actually took care of them, that had no like, you know, safety for or like you know help or, or whatever. Um, so, like, all, similarly, like, who's considered a criminal is a socially determined thing. We have laws that are not like written in the stars; they're written by people, and we can change our court systems and we can change our laws and we can change things like that um, um, or even like I'm also a teacher and you know managing somebody who has like a different way of being in the classroom is really difficult when you have 30 kids in the classroom if we had like one simple solution that I think about as a teacher is like you know if we had class sizes that were a third the size of what they are now like you can deal with anything like when you have a smaller group of kids like anything's fine you can like take a second to like help a kid more if they need it or whatever um, but in the end I think the solution to all of these is like yeah obviously our society is allocating resources in the wrong place our like our material the way our society is set up is all of the money goes to things that aren't actually meeting people's needs um, so that people like a lot of, of crime comes from poverty because people are in a situation where they're desperate and they don't know how to make ends meet and that's why what we call crime happens it's not considered a crime when you go to the Middle East and kill a million civilians for some reason but it's a crime when you steal bread to feed yourself um, you know so anyway so I, anyway I was just sort of I just wanted to say that hopefully I didn't ramble too much <laughs> Excellent points, thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Um, Yet another engineer. <laughs> yeah, sadly. No, <laughs> no I teach. Um, yeah, thank you to all of you for sharing all the things that you do. It struck so many points and kind of weaved a lot of narrative threads in my own family and life. Um, you know, I've experience I mean everybody's story you know I can say well that's my brother you know that's my sister and then you know as I'm going along I'm like shit that's me I forgot you know I forgot that I was institutionalized <laughs> you know like I wanted to get that just be done you know but like my own family was like he's a handful stick him in the mental institution you know I was in college, pulling straight A's, you know, my family was the handful. The society that made my, you know, family what it is, you know, all mixed up and, and everything, you know, uh, that's what put us all there. And, you know, those ripples and, you know, you say disablement being like a tool, you know, I watch it happen in so many different aspects of our society. You know, um, you know, it's a have and ha have not. It's a, um, I, well, I'm preaching to the choir, I guess, but, you know, it was a, a bit of, you know, as you were talking about, Jock, you know, you don't know that it's like, yeah, we're not in a prison, but we're in a prison, you know? I mean, there's no, I, I really struggled with this this year. I just, it's like, can I still be a teacher in the United States? You know, it's like, I, 
I'm literally watching it, these kids like, you know, come and yeah, I get to make art and make beautiful things with these kids, and maybe that's the thing, you know, like me, that was the thing that saved my life. Like, you know, I ended up in an institution because I was trying to kill myself. I forgot my own value, you know? And so, <clears throat> you know, that, uh, the societal pressure, you know, to perform and to be, you know, all these different things for so many people, and then, you know, the, uh, the rugged individualism, the bootstrap bullshit, right? <laughs> like, show me the person that pulled themselves up to positions of power, you know, by their bootstraps, right? Like, um, you know, but, uh, you know, I'm also a Buddhist. Um, I've been part of a Buddhist organization for years, and, you know, one of the first things they say, suffering's a constant, right? There's no escape. We're all here, we're all suffering, right? And then uh, the thing that was was powerful for me, you know, I didn't want to be part of religion, whatever, I was super skeptical about it for a while, but, you know, the idea that um, the institutionalism, like you said, robs us of that value, robs us of our power. You know, you think about a person that gets down to their primacy, this is who I am, and nobody else can tell me any different. You know, those are the people that always change society, you know, every time. They go and they drag everybody else with them. So, you know, if I can, you know, say anything is that, you know, you are all wonderfully powerful people um, and that the institutions, you know, should be scared. <laughs> so I appreciate you all. So people can keep talking. I just need to say, it's usually, I love yeah, that. Like, another, that's such a nice little, yeah. Another comment before we wrap up for the night? Yeah. No. Oh, no, right. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Just say again. Yeah, I, so, I think, like, something, something that Eli said is, like, we have to have a material analysis of our conditions and of what, like, how we're, how we're moving about in the world. It's always coming down to the material reality. Um, and, and something like I was thinking about, like, the way that I think in, like, more mainstream spaces and more mainstream disability spaces, there tends to be a, uh, a sort of thread that comes about of, like, um, so thinking of ableism in sort of the abstract or in sort of, like, in more individual um, uh, manifestations. I think of it as more of, like, a, a mechanism of disciplining us. It's a mechanism of disciplining us into capitalist structure, right? Through the ways that it wears us down, you know, the ways that we're, able, we're, we're expected to perform, and the ways that, you know, our, they tell us our bodies have to be, or our, our minds have to be, et cetera. Um, and that's the thing. And then, like, there's also, like, a, there's also another, another aspect of, like, um, there are like there there are a certain um, a, 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 a certain subset of disabled folks who end up like being um, like elevated into power who get uh, uh, who um, become petit bourgeois or bourgeoisie you know and those folks um, end up like being diametrically opposed to poor and working disabled people. So it's not always that like it's disabled people versus able-bodied people, or you know, um, an us versus them kind of scenario. Because there is a particular class of disabled people who are um, who have kind of their class aspirations or interests are in line with the capitalist structure. Who, um, yeah. So and that's how like you know sort of um, certain tenets of mainstream disability politics ends up like upholding capitalism and in and, and, and US empire. So um, having that sort of material analysis of everything is very key. Okay. I think we are going to wrap it up for the evening. It's getting late. Um, let's have a round of applause for our panel.